what people outside the faith think about evangelism or talking to other people about your faith. That's what we'll talk about today. Evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men, but instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus, D. Elton Trueblood. Today we're going to talk a little bit about atheism. I mentioned a few podcasts ago, for as long as I could remember when I was a kid and all the way up to the time I was 21, I never believed in God. And it wasn't that I was agnostic where I thought we couldn't know the nature of God. I just didn't even believe there was a God. I took after my father. Now, the difference between him and how I mentioned it before is he hated religion. He hated religious people. I saw it on the Air Force bases we were among, that whenever there was someone who was religious, he would stay clear of them entirely. He just had no room in his heart for anyone religious, which is interesting because if you talk to him about it, he said it was because religious people are so bigoted and so ingrained in their own ideas that they can't accept other people, which made me wonder, isn't that exactly the same thing he's doing? To me, I was like, you know, you should do for your life whatever you see fit. You know, if you need religion, if you need something to feel that there's something there, does it make you a better person? Does it make you strive for better things? Then, you know, clearly religion is not all bad. It created schools. It created the hospital systems. It was the first methods of charity within societies. It has done a lot of good in the world. But for me, I just don't need it at all. There was a fellow named Stephen Roberts who said the quote, I contend that we are both atheists. I just believe in one fewer God. Bringing the point that I dismiss a lot of gods, he just dismisses one more of them. But is that actually true too? For me, I thought if it's doing you some good, if it's bringing something valuable to your life, or it's bringing something valuable to society, hospitals, schools, charities, then yes, you know, fine, that is great for you. But for me, I don't need it and I don't want it. And to me, when I was thinking about religion, and I read a lot about different faiths, I almost did a study of it from the time I was in eighth grade all the way through high school. I read a lot about religions because I was just fascinated about it. You know, sometimes when I see people who really feel music deeply, I'm curious and I go, huh, how does that work that music makes you feel that deeply about it and it doesn't to me? It's kind of how I was about religion, too. I just couldn't imagine what people see in it. But again, if that was your thing, I wasn't going to fight you about it, unlike my dad. There's all sorts of different philosophical questions out there and arguments about there. Like, for example, if there's no God and there's no moral standard out there, therefore, does anything become evil? Because it's just evil in your mind or my mind. It's not necessarily any sort of yes or no because there's no God that created us. And what got me, too, is even when I started mildly believing in Judaism, I realized that a lot of my family would select the things that they believed in when it came to the Torah and the Haftorah. They would say, well, yeah, that's true, but this isn't true. And I thought, well, what gives them the right to decide? Maybe the part where God is good is the wrong part, or maybe the part where it's telling you that you have to follow all these rules is the right part. And once you start going down that exit ramp of deciding what you're going to believe or not believe, how does it not destroy the rest of your faith? And then there's other people who take it from the point of view of, well, there's no proof, therefore there's no God to believe in. It's more of a philosophical evidence type of argument instead of saying this is the nature of evil or this is the nature of good. And there's even some people, I think, like Sam Harris and some others, that this is a mechanism in the brain to try to get you to act in a certain way within society. And so there's two different sides of it. Someone calls it the implicit versus explicit. Implicit means you just don't have any faith, while explicit means you've rejected faith. Positive and negative schools of thought 
A positive atheism means there is proof in my life that no God exists, while a negative atheism means that I have found no proof of a God and therefore I don't believe it. And they believe that atheism started in ancient Greece. They started seeing in the schools of philosophy somewhere around the 5th century BC where people stopped believing in the gods. You know, Cicero translated Greek and found the Greek word into atheos, which means atheistic, essentially. And he was using it, too, to be this debate between the Hellenists, the people who believe the Greek gods, and the early Christians. That debate that's there. In the French, then later, it was a person who just denied the existence of God. It would have been nice to think that I was actually an agnostic. I think that would have made me feel better that I had an open mind about things. But I really just didn't. I didn't believe in God, and I didn't think that we did anything but push up daisies when life was over with. It never struck me as anything more. And now, a lot of times, we see in atheism this very strong anger about it. First of all, oh, it's just what my stupid parents believe. It's a very pejorative, dismissive type of comment. Or, haven't we gone farther in society? Haven't we outgrown the stupidity? I've been listening to the book Bonhoeffer recently, and it talks a lot about what Hitler and what the Nazis believed. And some of them wanted to recreate the Norse gods. They saw themselves as the heirs of the Vikings. But Hitler was really against this. He believed that we've come too far. <laughs> How can we go back to believing in stupid gods when we've already proven they don't exist and aren't we better than this? And so he was against what um, other people were doing trying to bring back this Norse religion. He was an atheist. He eventually locked up the preachers who would not say that he is God, that he should be worshipped, that his picture should be on the, every altar in the church in Germany. And he didn't believe that he was a God because he didn't believe in any gods, but he believed that he should be the focal point of all the attention in society. So this took a really angry uh, bent to it. And people talk a lot about Nietzsche, too, and how Nietzsche brought that atheism to the forefront. But I think he also asked the question, when I read it in college, now that we have killed God, what's going to become of us? How is society going to go? Because if our treatment of each other, I know people have treated people each other poorly in the name of faith, but it had this ethical belief to it. And it kept people going. I would suggest that when you find people who treated people very poorly, I imagine their faith in God was a lot more about lip service than it was about actually believing in God. And a lot of times, too, up to the late 1800s, people couldn't read the whole Bible. They couldn't read the actual word of God. All they had was what other people told them. And so when you start getting into Luther, and Tyndale, and translations of the Bible in languages people could actually read, suddenly people knew what it was they were supposed to do. So people then oftentimes look at the behavior of people who believe in God and say, see, there's no God. Look at how these people are believing. Brings us all the way up to Karl Marx, who believed that religion was the opiate of the people or the opium of the people. And that means that it was a way of assuaging people so that they wouldn't rise up against their cruel leaders. But by giving them God, it was this horrible illusion that was causing people to just stay stuck in history. Then there's a more scientific view of atheism, which I had sympathies for because I was a very scientific person. I was an astronomy major when I first went into college, always been interested in space is that science will explain everything, that we just don't know enough, but at some point we'll have enough science to explain everything that's happened. So I think that the more I've seen about science and theories, the more I think it's become open. It used to be, these are the theories, and this is exactly how it happens. And now it seems like there's a lot of questions. My belief in God is even stronger nowadays because of science. Darwin never saw DNA. And now that I know that we all have this cookbook, we all have this recipe, 
that makes me, me and you, you and makes you tall and makes me short. It's so complex. It's not just a random activity. I just got done with um, Dr. Mukherjee's book, The Gene, and it's so amazing. But to get to this point of complexity is even beyond, I think, what Darwin ever saw. So I'm always curious that if I had never become a Christian and all these different situations and science started exposing things, I wonder what I would have felt about the whole thing. I think a lot of times when I talk to even younger people about atheism and why they're atheists, it seems like they never had a grown-up faith, that they grew up believing in something, and then their faith is sort of stuck in that eighth-grade Sunday school mentality that they say, oh, well, how do you explain this or how do you explain that? And I said, well, that's pretty easy, actually. And there's a good conversation about it, but they never got to that point. They never expended any energy to find out what those arguments are. They just say something glib, making this a very adult and mature look at what faith means, what does a grown-up faith mean, and what does God mean as a part of all of this? So then there's two stories that I wanted to bring out that I thought were interesting from two atheists and their perspective on evangelism specifically. And it makes me think about how far are people willing to go to what extreme or what discomfort are people willing to do in order to talk about Jesus to other people? There was this interesting fellow, and this was a story that was written um, a long time ago. But it was about a criminal who was going to be put to death. His name was Charlie Peace. And essentially, when he was being put to death, you know, the preacher, the chaplain of the prison in Leeds, England, would come and talk to him about God and talk to him about hell and talk to him, hoping, you know, at a last minute change of heart when it comes to this. And he said, sir, if I believed what you and the Church of God says you believe, even if in England was covered in broken glass, from coast to coast, I would walk over it, if need be, on hands and knees, and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like that. It was some statement about the importance of it being true and whether or not we act in such a way that we believe it's true, that if we believe that there was a bridge that was out, And we saw a bunch of bikers riding towards this bridge, and they were all going to plop right over the cliff. We would be waving our arms, stop, stop, you have to stop, the bridge is out, you're going to die. We would do anything we could do to get people from falling off the edge of the bridge. And yet we believe in the gospel, and we believe in the saving grace of Jesus, and we believe that the cross gives us that bridge to cross over regardless of the sins that we've created in our lives, why don't we tell it? Why wouldn't we walk over broken glass just to save one soul if it's that awful and salvation is that wonderful? And so it was stunning to me that someone who wasn't a believer saw that whole idea so strongly. And then the next quote comes from Pendulet who was a very famous atheist. He was at one point, I think, very antagonistic towards religion, but then started getting friends with faith and realized that they're not meaning him harm, that when I tell you about Jesus, I'm not trying to hurt you. If I didn't care about you at all, I wouldn't tell you. If I thought nothing of you, I would keep my ideas to myself. It's a hard sell. I know it's true, but I fundamentally believe that telling people the truth about Jesus is the most loving thing you can do. And so that's where we'll talk about in the next podcast, how to talk about God without being a jerk. That was kind of my mental subtitle of the presentation I always did to this Christian college. Because if we know something that is so vitally important to people and we don't tell them, that's actually hateful. That's actually harmful. That's actually just protecting ourselves over the eternal souls of other people. So this is what Penn Jillette said. And I'll put the link to the actual YouTube video in the show notes. 
I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect them at all. If you believe there's a heaven and a hell and that people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it and that truck was bearing down on you, there's at a certain point I tackled you. And this is more important than that. He said this guy, who was a really good guy, someone who came up to him after a show, he was polite, he was honest, he was sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a Bible. It must be scary, you know, especially when you're talking about stars and famous people and all of that. But he respected the fact that this guy got the muster up to go and give him a Bible and care for it. And we, I think, shrink from it. We don't want to tell people about Jesus because we think it's scary. I I still think it's scary. I came to faith because someone was bold enough to tell me about Jesus. And yet, it can be still scary to me, which is why I have the whole class that I give to the college, because I think I found a way to do it in a way that doesn't make you a jerk and doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. But in some ways, this person Charlie Peace and Pendulette saw the truth of the matter that if you had a secret that would save them for all eternal time and you didn't tell them about it, it's uncaring. I don't know. I have a friend who said that she thinks that Christians are a group of people who just want to tell people what to do. And we just love going and evangelizing to them because we get to say, I'm cool and you're not and you're awful. But I told her, I said, you know, the truth of it is, is that telling people about Jesus is one of the most scary things we have to do as Christians. And if God came down tomorrow and said, hey, you know, that whole evangelism thing, don't worry about it. I got this. We would rejoice. Most of us would be thankful that we wouldn't have to do this anymore. But then comes up the interesting question. If this is something that is so painful, so hard for us to do, why did God give us the Great Commission? to go there for and preach the good news, knowing that we would really dislike it. And you know what the answer always is? Is if you look throughout the entire time in the Bible, it is filled with people who just wanted to be left alone. And God always brings people in, whether they feel they have the skills or not to do it, and makes them a part of his story, regardless of their weaknesses, regardless of the things they did wrong in the past. God wants us to be a part of his story. Just like I think parents want their children to be a part of the family story too. So my challenge to you is think about what it means to you to tell other people about Jesus and give an honest appraisal about whether you think you're doing that, you're not doing that, and what you could do to maybe take one step further And telling that person that we know you love about Jesus, because in the end, it's the most loving thing we can do. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe and tell a friend. Again, I'm trying to grow the podcast to see if more people can listen, and maybe this would be helpful to other people. If you also write a review, I'd appreciate it a great deal. And if you have anything to say to me, You can find me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Have a wonderful week. And remember that our walk with God is about bringing other people along with us using small steps. Small steps.